Good morning, everybody. Hello, oh, Schnitzel. Okay, sorry, I gotta dish out the bribery peppers before we get started. These guys have two settings and they are adorable and apocalyptic, and we never quite know which ones we're gonna get with the peppers' help. So, welcome and thank you, everybody, for joining me on this Saturday morning. I really like these ones, they always feel kind of chill, a little bit more relaxed. Um, and so these are always my favorite in case you wanted to know um, you wanted to come and join me sort of our chill day and of course we've had the previous webinars so we've got all those questions and comments that have rolled in and of course you just get the answers to those here so before we get started everybody hop over to the chat box so it looks like that little chat bubble and i want you to look for that blue button and i want you to switch it from hosts and panelists to everybody and the reason that i want you to do that is if you have like a question or a comment um during our talk together um you can just drop it in there and i'm gonna like loop back i'll keep an eye on it while we're talking to one another um and i'll you know it's just sort of a way that we can interact with one another i know this is always kind of like focused outward from my point of view i love interacting with you guys if you want to shoot me a hello let me know where you're from i love sort of seeing where you guys are coming from from all over the world because you guys are from everywhere i have talked to people from guam i have talked to people from the us i've got canadians in here of course i've got um people from new zealand i know i have people from australia so like shoot me a hi let me know where you're from i always like to know sort of where we're reaching each other um, um, so yeah, we are here today to talk about the five reasons that you might be struggling to manage your IBS symptoms. And if we haven't met before, because um, again, I know you guys come from kind of everywhere. My name is Amy and I'm a Monash certified um, IBS health coach and nutritionist. And what I do is basically create a clear and simple strategy for people who are struggling to figure out the right path for their IBS. I know it can feel sometimes like you're trying a hundred billion different things or you've tried literally everything and you just can't seem to get your symptoms under control. My idea, uh, sort of my role in your life is to really take that burden off of you and help you sift through all of the information that's coming at you. And we'll talk a little bit about the information you might be receiving today, um, but really to just sort of clarify and find those few simple things that are really game changers for you and how to build them into a plan that feels automatic and just kind of the way you do things instead of what it might be now, which is trying to remember to jump through all these hoops during the day. So today we're going to be talking about these five reasons that you might be struggling to get your IBS symptoms under control. And the first one is that you're focusing only on food. And this one is really important. So first of all, I want to say that it's totally normal that you would be focusing on food. Let's just take one second to normalize that for you. Okay. So you are being bombarded with information about like, you know, eat this, not that you are being given lists of soluble and insoluble fiber to manage your IBS symptoms. Um, you know, you're being told by everybody like, oh, like you have to eat in this method or you have to follow this diet. Like it makes total sense that our focus is on food. We also eat food all day. And so it makes sense that our brains will be kind of connecting for us. Like, hey, like you ate that thing and then we had symptoms. Like it makes total sense that like those grapes are evil. Um, and so, you know, we're we're cutting those out of our diet and then we eat something else and we get symptoms and we cut that out of our diet and we eat something else and we get symptoms and we cut that out of our diet um and it can sort of create this cycle where things are coming out and nothing's coming back in and you're not really getting that symptom relief or you're getting symptom relief for like a little while but then it just swings back and you're like okay well like now what am i eating and part of that problem is that we do eat all day um, and our brain is a terrible detective. And so our brain is really trying with the most positive intentions for us to keep us safe, keep us feeling well, um, but it can only think back so far. And so it's gonna pick something within like the last two or three meals that you've eaten to sort of pin as the culprit. Um, and we are hardwired to believe our brains. And so it makes a hundred percent sense that we would be focusing only on food because that is what society is telling us, right? That might be what your um, nutritionist is telling you. That might be what your GI has told you. It's what the entire internet is telling you, um, but you're a whole person. 
right? We're not just going to pull your guts out of your body, right? We're not just dealing with your guts here. We're dealing with you as a whole person, as a whole body, if that makes sense. And so some of the things that we want to think about are like sleep, uh, stress. We want to talk about um, baseline IBS hygiene. So when we're talking about sleep, I know everybody's like, well, like, get, get more sleep. Um, and that's really easy to say, um, especially if you're not talking about sort of what that means, like get more, get a higher quality. Um, but the important part about sleep, like, first of all, we don't even understand all all the things that sleep does for us, right? We know that it's like critical, it's mission critical to having a functioning body. Um, there are two things that we want to think about with sleep. And the first one is um, sort of quantity. So we want to make sure that we're getting the right amount of sleep cycles because we sleep in these little, they're about 80 minutes to 120 minutes. It's different for everybody, but your body has to do these cycles. They're like dishwasher cycles. Um, and I don't know if you've ever woken up in the morning and just feel like you've been hit by a train or you're just kind of like, oh, like I don't know how I'm going to function today. You probably woke up in the wrong part of that cycle because we wake up and we go to sleep in light sleep. Um, and so if you're in REM sleep or you're in like that really deep sleep, that is not a great place to wake up from and you're gonna you're gonna feel that um so you have the sleep quality it's like the number of cycles that you need um and then the sorry that's the quality or sorry the quantity and then the quality of of course is making sure that these are condensed so we call it consolidated sleep where you're having these cycles one after another um instead of like when you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're having trouble falling back to sleep so they're kind of happening in chunks or um you're sort of staying in that light sleep and you can't fall into these deeper kinds of sleep which is where our body does a lot of its maintenance tasks um and if our sleep is not the best if our sleep is poor quality um this has a huge impact on our bodies um and that has a huge impact of course on our ibs so some of the things that we want to think about when it comes to sleep are the circadian rhythm. And so the rhythm is sort of like a 24 hour clock that our bodies run on. It's called the master clock. Um, and this is in charge of regulating our hormones because we have a lot of hormones. Like it's in charge of many things. Um, but one of the main things that it does is it sort of does this orchestra of hormones for us because our hormones ebb and flow throughout the day. They also ebb and throw flow throughout the month. Um, and this is how our body sort of does all of its processes. We have chemicals to tell us it's morning, you have to wake up. You know, that's kind of why you start perking up around, you know, like that, that 10 to one, you start perking up. Those are all of your fun hormones. Um, and then you start, you know, getting a little bit like quieter, a little bit more restful as you're sort of getting into the darker area of the day. That is your body gearing up for sleep. Like that is like a three hour process before you even get into your bedroom to go to sleep. Um, and so when this system is off, one of the um, sort of pairs of hormones that are deeply impacted are your hunger and fullness hormones, which are leptin and ghrelin. And so I don't know if you've ever had a poor night's sleep and you wake up and you just are like eating everything and it feels uncontrollable and you're not even 100% sure if you're hungry, but like stuff is just going in your face. Um, those are those hormones being sort of out of whack. You can also be very irritable because we have chemicals um, sort of in our brain are off. You might find that you are easily agitated or irritated. You might find like, I don't know if somebody like dropped something and you kind of jump. Um, this is because our fight or flight uh, sort of system is being activated and it's because our reflexes are off. And so our body is being hyper vigilant now about keeping us safe. And so it feels like it has to look for everything. It's got to, you know, every sound, every gurgle, every, you know, everything that it can detect, it has to be on high alert because it's going to take us longer to respond. And so we're just sitting there waiting to respond, right? We don't have to power up. We're just ready to go. Whenever this bear comes to get us, like we're on it. Um, so all of these things are impacting our IBS because if you're eating bigger volumes of food throughout the day, right, you're just, you're craving carbs, you're craving, um, you know, sweets, you're craving caffeine, we're going to end up with larger quantities of these foods in our digestive tract and having large volumes of food um, can be very stressful for our body and this can sometimes trigger things like bloating, it can trigger cramping, um, it can trigger just your general IBS symptoms. Um, also, when we're eating larger meals, we might be FODMAP stacking. So if you would normally have, you know, a portion that was right for you, um, even without measuring it, like for FODMAP quantity, whatever. Um, if you're in a position where you end up like doubling that meal and it feels right to your body, you're following your hunger cues, um, you might have ended up FODMAP stacking. And then again, this can lead to excess water being pulled into the bowel. This can lead to excess fermentation, which is, you know, not something that we want to experience. And then of course we have this nervous system, which is um, triggering the communication between our gut and our brain, that gut brain axis. And I like to call it sort of um, aggressive interpersonal communication. And so we have um, sort of everybody is on high alert. Everybody is feeling agitated. 
So even if you were eating a normal diet during the day, even if you were, you know, managing your FODMAP stacking, all of those things, when our nervous system is on high alert, things that might feel normal to you or might just be like mildly uncomfortable to you because this system is on high alert, it's being hypervigilant, um, those messages may be traveling differently through um, your um, through your gut brain axis. And so you might be experiencing sort of a larger response to those. So the same kind of thing goes for stress management. We have our entire nervous system is involved with that, right? Our whole body is involved with that. And so when you're feeling stressed out, again, your sleep might be off. Um, you might be experiencing, um, you know, like the, the rapid heart rate and shallow breathing, all of these little things that tell our critter brain that the situation is not something that we want to be in. Our critter brain is the part of our brains that help keep us safe. Their whole job is to keep us alive and feeling well. Some people call it the lizard brain. It's that primal part of our brain that's whole purpose is to keep us alive and functioning. And so when we're in stressful situations, whether that's we didn't sleep well, or our boss is yelling at us, or we're late for an important meeting, um, this is going to, again, activate that fight or flight system where we have, you know, blood is being pulled out of our organs and so now our gut is not functioning um, in an efficient way or we might stop digesting and then we have food just sitting in our guts and of course if you've eaten something that's highly fermentable now that means that while it's sitting there it's going to just continue to be fermented until it's allowed to leave the digestive system okay so when we talk about stress management and i know that that's really easy to say from this side of the screen like manage your stress like you haven't considered managing your stress already um but there are tools and strategies that we can use to sort of lower that for you. Like there are very specific skills and techniques that um, can help you flip yourself from that fight or flight into rest and digest, especially while you're eating, um, that can really help manage those symptoms for you. So another thing outside of the sort of food category is your basic IBS hygiene. Right? So we know that there are like tons of um, just general gut irritants and you can do, you should really be doing your basic IBS hygiene before you even get into something like the low FODMAP diet. So not everybody needs the low FODMAP diet, right? Um, and so we don't want to put you in something super restrictive, you know, take all these things away from your gut bugs, away from you. Um, if really what you need to do is avoid spicy food. Um, so the general gut irritants are, of course, alcohol, spicy food, fatty food, greasy food, um, like chocolates in there. Um, I'm missing stuff. I'm missing stuff. Anyways, it's like avoiding carbonated beverages. It's making sure that you're eating um, meals that are I'm gonna call them small meals, um, but it's like making sure that you're eating frequently throughout the day and kind of on a schedule so that your body knows how to manage the fuel that's coming through. Um, we want to make sure that there are not large periods of fasting, but also we want to make sure that there are not periods of grazing because then um, we have issues with the migrating motor complex. So it's just kind of the dishwasher cycle in between your meals. So we usually say try and make sure that you're eating every you know three to four hours. So that might be breakfast and lunch and then a snack and then dinner, maybe another snack depending on what you need. Um, but trying to make sure that you're not sort of um, dumping huge amounts of food into your gut um, sort of willy nilly throughout the day, because then your gut's left to do a lot of work um, and it might not be prepared to do that okay. So step number one is when you're focusing only on food and we're sort of leaving out these parts about sleep quality and quantity, stress management, and then just IBS basics, okay? So the second thing that we wanna think about is focusing on cutting foods out instead of adding foods in. And so when you look at the stuff that's online, you know, a lot of it is like, oh, like, don't eat this and don't eat that and never eat this if you have IBS. Like, no, 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 no. I want to start by saying like, sure, there might be foods that aren't working for your body right now. Like, we don't know what's going on. We can't, we can't predict. We're not mind readers. We're not fortune tellers. We don't know what's going to work for your body 10 years from now. But there could be a food or a couple of foods or a FODMAP group that is just not jiving with your body right now, okay? Totally open to that happening. But we don't want cutting foods out to be um, sort of the focus of how we manage our IBS symptoms, okay? Because again, this creates this cycle where things are coming out. And if we can't even prove that those were the triggers for your symptoms, you might be cutting things out. Um, with for no reason and now you know your body doesn't have access to those nutrients your gut bugs don't have access to those nutrients um <clears throat> and so we want to make sure that if you are pulling something out that we've done something like an elimination and rechallenge where we can empirically see i took this out i felt better i put it back in my symptoms returned i can like very clearly see i only changed this one variable and my symptoms did a thing like you might even repeat it twice just to make sure it wasn't a fluke. Like, okay, I've proven beyond a reasonable doubt that this food is not jiving with my body right now. Okay, this is the same way that we test for food allergies. Um, 
okay, so like now that food has evidence, but if you're doing things like, um, like food sensitivity tests, like if you have paid somebody money to do a food sensitivity test for you, those have been debunked. Okay, so researchers from, um, where was it from? It's researchers from the UK, the US and Canada have put out like official statements debunking um, these like blood tests, hair tests, saliva tests that tell you your food sensitivities. If you've had one of those, those are garbage. Um, and so I want you to look through the list of foods that they took you, that they told you to take out um, and really consider, did I already suspect that one of those was a trigger for me or loop in someone like a health coach or a dietitian or a nutritionist um, to help you try and reintroduce some of those foods because the protein that they look for. So they tell you it's like an allergy, right? If you have an allergy, um, a specific antibody is released in your body. So you do like a blood test, you see the antibody and you're like, cool, um, this person is allergic to peanuts or this person is allergic to shellfish. Um, and these, these food sensitivity tests are based on the same premise where they're gonna do like a blood test or a hair sample and they're gonna look for these antibodies um, that have tagged these specific foods. Um, and then the tagging of them, right? Like stamping them with a little barcode is gonna tell you that you're sensitive to those foods. Um, the problem is now that we understand more about how our immune system works, it turns out that those particular barcodes are more like the kind of stamp that you would get if you like went to a concert, right? To say that you paid. So you've really just been stamped and it's saying this, this food is free to come in and out as it pleases. Um, and so you basically have a grocery list of foods that you've eaten recently. And so this is one of the reasons why if you're looking at the results of these food sensitivity tests, um, many of my clients have found that it's mostly their safe foods and they're devastated. They're like, well, what am I going to eat now? Because I was down to this pool of 10 foods and all of them are my highest triggers. And that makes total sense because if you're only eating 10 foods, of course, they're going to be in your body in a huge amount and they're going to have, you know, lots of stamps. And so they're going to come out on this test showing is that you have a very high um, sort of level of these antibodies for this food. Um, so all of that to say, instead of focusing on taking things out, often it is more effective to focus on what we can bring in. And one of the reasons is because we need diet diversity for our microbiome. These guys are picky eaters, they're like toddlers. And so we need to present them with a huge variety of food in order for them to be able to have what they need, okay? And so if we're constantly pulling stuff out, we are also um, sort of shortening the pool of foods that they have access to. And a healthy microbiome, like we're learning that these are making short chain fatty acids for us. These are helping support our immune system either by signaling the immune system to come in. They also have the ability to kill some pathogens in our um, sort of gut themselves. They help us um, like they help us absorb specific vitamins and minerals that our bodies can't digest on their own. So they can't pull them out from our um, intestines into our bloodstream. They can only absorb them as a byproduct. So like a gut bag has eaten these vitamins and it sort of poops them out and we can absorb the poop just fine, but we couldn't absorb that raw mineral. Like there are so many jobs that our microbiome has, like they help us maintain our gut, um, sort of like the mucus barrier in our gut. Um, and so we really, really need them to stay healthy. And many of my clients find that um, the more food we're able to add in over time, like they'll email me back months later and be like, oh my gosh, like I can eat all my FODMAPs now. Um, and it's because my, my gut is functioning in such a way that, you know, my, my buckets just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I really can eat whatever I want now, or my symptoms are just level and I don't have to think about them anymore. And it's because in adding more food to your diet, we've actually helped support your body enough that it can sort of overcome one of the obstacles that it was facing before. Um, and that's not to say that it's a cure for IBS. Currently, there is no cure for IBS, and that's because it's not a structural issue, it's not a chemical issue, um, and because we can't pinpoint and say that it's there, we also can't say that it's not there anymore, um, which is the definition of a cure. Um, but I've had tons of clients go into remission, um, and that is good enough for them. And a lot of it is just making sure that they are staying healthy, that they are adding all the vitamins and nutrients and minerals and things that they need to keep themselves and their microbiomes happy. Okay, so. Another part about pulling out foods constantly is that we might end up leaning on foods that we're not realizing are contributing to our symptoms. And that's because it can take anywhere from like four to 12 hours. I've had one client who ran on a 24 hour cycle for her food sensitivities. Um, and so if you're eating something and your brain is like, it was those grapes that we ate two hours ago, and it's really something you ate 24 hours ago, you might end up with a pool of foods that you think are safe for you because you don't, you never eat them and immediately have a reaction. Um, but because these are making up a majority of your diet now, um, 
they can cause a ton of problems and you won't be able to pinpoint them unless you know how to do like a methodical and systematic food test in order to check like what is actually bothering me. Um, so one of my pet peeves when um like i went to i went to my gi um I, I have clients come from their gis i have friends come from their gis um and they come out with the advice like eat more fiber um it just drives me to insanity because there are like seven different types of fiber and like i don't expect you to know what they are that's not your job um unless you work sort of in the food health industry like that is not a thing that you can really Google unless you know what you're looking for. Um, and so here is your heads up that too much fiber can actually make constipation worse. OK, so if you are just like jamming yourself with fiber and you're like, why isn't this constipation getting any better? Or you're noticing that you're even more bloated or you're having more abdominal pain or, you know, it seems to take even longer to have your bowel movements or you're, you know, you have to strain even more. It could be that you have too much fiber or it could be that you're eating the wrong type of fiber or it could be that you needed a clean out first. And so you are eating the right type of fiber, um, but it's getting stuck behind something else. And so we really have to clean out the first part and then reassess um, sort of what type of fiber is um, appropriate and right for your body, right? Because what is healthy and right for one body is not necessarily healthy and right for you, okay? So another thing is that I have a lot of my um, diarrhea predominant clients come and they just keep taking out fiber like salad doesn't work for me vegetables don't work for me I, I can't eat this I can't eat that. Um, and there are actually a ton of fibers that are specific for diarrhea um, and they will actually help relieve your diarrhea and so sometimes by taking out certain types of fiber um, you're sort of robbing your body of an opportunity to write itself right like so there are tons of different things that we can eat that will actually help um, either remove excess water like it'll absorb it and turn it into a gel that like now it's more of a formed stool um, there are tons that are like lower in um, so we call them as osmotic FODMAPs are ones that sort of attract and pull this excess water into the bowel. Um, sometimes we can just swap a type of fiber and be like, cool, like this one pulls in way less water. Let's see if combining these ones that form a gel with ones that pull in less water altogether can help you relieve some of that diarrhea. Um, and then of course, once we get the system running smoother, we get your microbiome fed a little better. Um, if the issue is something like dysbiosis where your um, your butt, your, your butt gugs. Oh my gosh, guys, we're having a day. Your gut bugs. Um, if, if they're a little out of balance, um, sometimes just getting the, the goodies, a little bit more fiber that they can sort of, you know, power up, um, can help you balance the symptoms a little better. And then we'll be leaning on less of our tools because your body can just write itself if that makes sense. Okay. So for that one, we're talking about, um, focusing on cutting foods out instead of putting foods in and that I'm of course, impacts the diversity for, for you and for your microbiome. And then, of course, leaning on foods that might be contributing to your symptoms or leaving out foods that could be helping you manage your symptoms. OK, so let me just have the time. <laughs> I got off on a bit of a tangent there. Sorry. Um, so number three is that we're not addressing mechanical issues. OK, so again, not everything has to do with food. You're a whole person. There is a whole body in and around your digestive tract that could be impacting um, your experience of having IBS. Um, so one of those, and it always takes me two times to say this, um, dysenergic. Oh, I got it on the first time. Dysenergic bowel movements. And so these are uncoordinated muscles, okay? And so this might be that you've had like a, a bowel surgery or you've had some sort of bowel injury or you've been struggling with like chronic watery diarrhea or you've been really struggling with constipation, lots of straining. Um, our gut muscles can lose their um, sort of flow, right? So when we have these peristalsis waves, which is how our body moves food from sort of one you know, from, from your face to your butt, um, we do them using peristalsis waves, which are a coordinated wave of muscles that sort of squeeze it like a tube of toothpaste from one end to the other. And if they're not coordinated, um, it makes it very difficult for our body to sort of do its normal function. Um, another issue is per paradoxical muscle contractions. I mean, I always think this one is cool. Um, the people who are experiencing it think it's less cool until we've corrected it. Um, but basically what paradoxical muscle contractions are, are, um, so when we talk about the pelvis, there's like the floor of the pelvis and the sphincter that we have conscious control of. So it's like the last door before, you know, our poop hits the bowl. Um, this one is supposed to relax. So everything squeezes in our bodies, right? We're like, okay, we're going to poop. Like, okay, like uh, poop. Um, this one is supposed to relax. And when we get this paradoxical muscle contraction, this door 
ends up closing tighter and it thinks it's doing a great job and it's helping um, and that door is just shut. And so we can't poop and it doesn't really matter how much you strain and how much you breathe and bear down and all those things that door is like slammed shut. Um, and so this can be fixed with things like biofeedback. This can be fixed with things like deep breathing and like consciously relaxing our muscles. Like this again is fixable, um, but you're not going to fix that with diet if that makes sense. Okay. So another issue is reduced muscle tone. And again, this can happen if we're chronically constipated. If you are constipated from one end of your colon to the other end of your colon, it doesn't leave a lot of room for your muscles to contract. And so they might lose their tone. It's very similar if you're having chronic watery diarrhea. And if stuff is sort of doing a slip and slide through your body, it doesn't need a lot of muscle contractions in order to do that. Um, sorry. Um, and so we might lose some of the muscle tone and that's okay. It's exactly the same as if you were sick for a couple of weeks and you get up and you're trying to go to the gym or something and you're like, whew, I can feel that I have not been to the gym in a while. Doesn't mean that you're not going to build up that strength again, but you kind of have to take it at your own pace. You might need to, you know, put your weights down for a minute and, you know, try something a little bit lighter. Totally cool. But we do need to be conscious that if your muscles have not been able to contract the way that they would normally be contracting, you might need to build up a bit of muscle tone um, in order to have productive bowel movements regularly, if that makes sense. Um, Another thing is like digestive hygiene, which is a little bit different just from IBS hygiene, but this is really how you're eating your food. Okay. So many people do not chew their food properly. It takes the average person three chews to chew their foods. And that is, that is not enough times <laughs> is, is to put it lately. Um, you should be chewing like 20 to 30 times. Anything you put in your mouth should feel like applesauce or soup before you swallow it. So like, obviously you don't have to chew soup 20 times. Um, but the reason that we need to chew things so many times is obviously because mechanically we're breaking it down. But also when food is in our mouths, we have um, like we have enzymes for breaking down carbohydrates. And so those are all getting sort of broken down and dissolved right in our mouth. We have enzymes for unraveling protein so that the protein is ready when it gets into our stomach to be broken apart by different enzymes. Like there are things that um, help us identify like fat and break that down. Um, sort of our brain is keeping a catalog of what we're eating so that it knows what to get ready kind of down the line. It's keeping track of how much food it thinks we're going to have so that the peristalsis wave is triggered and we can make enough room for everything that we're eating. So there's a lot of stuff happening while you're chewing. We also want to make sure that we're eating slowly. Um, and that's to give us enough time to hear our body's signals about like, okay, I'm fully going to stop because like I'm getting uncomfortable or I'm still hungry. Like we're going to need more food or I'm not feeling satisfied, um, which is an indicator sometimes that we need a little bit more healthy fat um, to sort of cap off our meal in order to make sure that we have all of the nutrients that we need. Um, we want to make sure that we are eating mindfully so that we're staying in that nice relaxed state because we don't want to eat in that fight or flight. Cause remember that's drawing wa uh, water. It's drawing up. Uh, blood away from our digestive tract, which makes it very ineffective or will shut it down. And so of course we don't want to be pumping food into our digestive tract. If it's not on, <laughs> that's never good. Um, so there are kind of a lot of things that we want to think about just when it comes to our digestive hygiene, like how we're eating. Sometimes how you're eating is more important than what you're eating, if that makes sense. Um, like if I handed you the perfect meal and you ate it, but you were in fight or flight, you are not going to be able to pull out all of the nutrients that you would have been able to pull out otherwise. And then, you know, you're getting a gold star for putting it in your body, but sort of your body's like, okay, like you don't get a gold star for that because I couldn't actually eat any of it. And that doesn't seem fair to me. And so part of this is really um, just making sure that we're conscious about how we're eating because that is one of the mechanical issues that we have to address. Um, if we're gonna get your body under control in a way that feels automatic, it feels like just the way you're gonna do things. So you're not constantly jumping through all of these hoops, if that makes sense. Um, so for mechanical issues, we have those dyssynergic bowel movements. We have paradoxical muscle contractions. We have reduced uh, gut muscle tone and improper digestive hygiene. And there are more, like I could go, I could do a whole webinar on these, um, but those are the top ones that I tend to see in my practice. And again, those are all things um, that we could talk about. Those are all things that we can connect you to people for. These are all things where there are, you know, steps that we can take. But again, if you're focusing only on food, you're not going to be addressing any of these things, if that makes sense. Okay. So number four, and this one is a tricky one, and it's that you're following contradictory advice. And I just want to take one pause here and say, this is not to like blame or shame you or say like, why are you doing that? That's dumb. Like, no, that's not what we're doing here. Um, it makes perfect sense that this is happening. And I have not had, I have not had any clients, I think so far who weren't, who weren't following contradictory things. Um, and the reason is that 
most of us are told to Google stuff, honestly. Um, and again, if you don't work in this field, I would not expect you to know what is right for your unique body, right? Because IBS sits in each one of us differently and you can't Google that unless you kind of know what you're dealing with. And even when I meet clients, I don't know what we're dealing with. It takes us a couple of sessions to really connect with your body um, and really understand the whole picture. And that's based on what your other practitioners have told you. That's based on us doing a little bit of testing ourselves. It's based on us doing a little bit of tracking together and really figuring out what is the thing here. Um, so one example of this is say you have diarrhea and you went to your family doctor and they were like, cool, like, I don't know, just like go, go Google how to like handle diarrhea or here's like some medication or whatever, um, you know, go, go eat more fiber. Um, there is a difference between diarrhea caused by dysbiosis, which is, we talked about that imbalance between the goodies and the baddies. Um, there is overflow diarrhea where you're actually constipated and that, that first poop, that first, um, sort of train car is stuck and your body is doing like cramping and squeezing and pulling and whatever it can. You're getting that urge to go to the bathroom and nothing is coming out. Um, and then suddenly you're getting diarrhea. Um, what is happening is that first train car is stuck and your body is squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. And the only thing that can move is that liquid stool. So the stool that hasn't had all the water pulled out yet. And it's sort of going around the stool that is stuck. And then that is what you're able to pass. But the core issue is that you're constipated. And until we relieve the constipation, we cannot fix the diarrhea. And then we have another one, which is the FODMAP style diarrhea, which is that there's a food that's just pulling excess water into your bowel and your body doesn't have the capacity to pull enough water out before you need to go to the bathroom, okay? So if we were to approach all of these the same way, only one person would be successful following that advice, right? And so, you know, you might come in thinking like, well, the problem must be my body or I must be done because I'm following the instructions and it's not working. So like, I don't know how to do this any differently or my doctor must have been, you know, sort of like scooting me out the door and, and I'm on my own. Um, when really the advice that they gave you or, or what you found online wasn't meant for you. And again, how were you supposed to know that, right? So, the problem if you're following advice and it's not for your body is that first of all, you might not see a change, right? You're doing it and nothing is changing. So like, why am I doing this every day? Or you could continue to do it, not seeing a change, hoping that like, it just needs a minute to click in and you've wasted a lot of time when you could have been doing a strategy or using a tool that worked much better for you. Another alternative, of course, is that your symptoms get worse, right? Um, so, I mean, that, that one's pretty self-explanatory, it feels like. So you're, you're following a tool, it's not meant for you, your symptoms are getting worse, and now we have, you know, a second arrow of harm, where there was the first issue, right? So I was constipated or I had diarrhea, and that was a, like an issue that needed solving, and then I put in this piece of advice, and now I have a second issue. So I've got a second arrow that I have to deal with now, um, or a second source of pain. Um, and so we definitely don't want that. Um, the other problem, and this one just breaks my heart when we find it, um, is that if you're following two conflicting pieces of advice, one of those pieces of advice might have been perfect for you. Um, but because we're using another tool as well, if that tool is one of the ones that makes your symptoms worse, or if that one is one of the tools that is kind of throwing your body out of whack or off balance, you might not know that one of those tools was perfect for you. Um, and so then I have people who come into my practice and they're like, I've literally tried everything. I have tried every single thing. Um, you like, you name it, I've tried it. Um, but there was a piece of information missed sort of in all of the chaos that your body was experiencing in that moment. Um, and so that's why part of, um, part of IBS management, part of digestive, you know, these functional gut disorders is really taking things in a methodical way, like almost the slower, the better, changing one variable at a time so that you try something, it didn't work or it made a little shift. And like, can we improve that? Like, is there a way that we can layer another thing on top of that? That's going to make both of these fantastic. Can we swap that out for something that's going to get you more mileage? So you're still only doing one thing, or is there like, we're just going to drop this one and move on. Um, but we know for sure, because we're just changing the one variable at a time when we hit that tool, that's like the thing. And you're like, well, I just have to do this one thing now. And that's fantastic. Like I had one client, she came to me, her symptoms were terrible. She'd had them for 40 years, 40 years. She lived with these symptoms. Um, she needed to manage her calendar better, like her social calendar. It was the only thing she needed is she was getting really overwhelmed. She was getting burned out. Her nervous system was getting fried. Um, and so we talked about balancing her energy, like a bank account 
right? Like, do you have a budget for how you're managing your time? And so she kind of started budgeting things out and her entire body simmered down. Suddenly she could sleep. Suddenly, you know, she was able to go to bed on time. She was having consolidated sleep. Um, you know, um, we had her, like she wasn't getting weird cravings in the middle of the night. And so she wasn't eating too much um, sort of volume of food right before going to bed, um, which is part of your digestive hygiene. So like just this one thing of being like, how am I going to budget my time, my energy better shifted her entire experience of living in her body. And it wasn't even like, oh, I can only do one thing a week. Like she has that stuff managed and she's doing everything she wants. She's living her best life, but it was like one piece. And it was kind of funny in that case, but I've had one client who was taking her medication at the wrong time of day, sent her to her pharmacist. Her pharmacist was like, oh, like you should be taking that at night because then you get to sleep through the part that doesn't feel nice. And she's like, oh, like, that was fantastic. Um, so sometimes it's something really, really tiny. And it's hard to tell when you're in pain or you're not feeling well, or you've got like these 15 things that you're doing. And it can be really helpful to have some from someone from the outside, um, especially if they've done this a couple of times before. Um, it's, it can be really helpful to have somebody come from the outside listening for the things you already know, if that makes sense. So you come in like, I haven't had a client yet who hasn't told me what the problem is. They come in and they're like, oh, I think, I think it might be my medication, or I think I might not be sleeping well, or I think I might have a problem with wheat. Um, every single time somebody just sort of says something off the cuff, I like write it down. And a couple of weeks later, it often turns out that that was exactly what the problem was. Um, so you probably know what the issue is already. You just don't know that you know, if that makes sense, or there's too much stuff happening around you, or you're trying to balance too many things, or your symptoms aren't level enough that you can actually hear what the problem is. Um, and so, like I said, um, this following contradictory advice, like it, it can just end up being like layers and layers and layers and layers of responsibility on you. Guarantee there's like one or two things that are going to be a game changer for you. And you might be doing them already, or you might know what they are. Um, and all we have to do is take everything else in a way that it's not going to like shock or freak out your body. Um, it's not going to dismantle anything that you're doing. Of course, we always follow your doctor's instructions. Um, that's always very important. Um, if you're doing this on your own, like, don't just be like, man, I'm just going to stop doing everything. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> always call your doctor. If you're going to change something that they've recommended or your dietitian or anything. Um, but yeah, odds are either, you know, what the thing is and you just can't hear it or you can't see it yet because there's sort of, you know, like a chaotic kerfluffle happening around you. Um, or you're going to be able to find the thing that you're doing. Um, when we get everything calmed down and we start doing things really systematically, it, it often happens very, very quickly that you can find what the actual problem is. Um, so number five, this is our final point, um, is either you don't have IBS. So that's like a misdiagnosis and it doesn't have to be anything nefarious. Um, so you might be misdiagnosed or through all of the tools and strategies and things that you've been trying, all your hard work and all the energy that you've put in, your IBS symptoms are under control. And what's left is actually something else, right? And those are the symptoms that you're seeing. Um, again, this can be tricky if you don't have the technical skills to like separate out what is an IBS symptom versus what is not an IBS symptom. Um, but I've had a couple of clients now where we've actually gotten their IBS symptoms completely leveled. They come in and they're like, I need help with cramping. I need help with bloating. I need help with, you know, constipation or diarrhea or whatever. Um, and we've gotten every single symptom fixed except for one symptom. And I'm like, hmm, that's curious. So we go back to their doctor's office and it turns out that they had IBS and something else and they need like an antibiotic or they need, you know, like I had one client who had low stomach acid and needed help with that. Like, um, but it can be sometimes, sometimes it's not that your IBS isn't shifting. Sometimes it's that your IBS is totally under control. And because again, all of that chaos has like sort of lowered, we've lowered that white noise for you you can actually see something underlying. And sometimes that's actually the root cause of your IBS to begin with. And so we've got all of these tools going. Um, you know, we've got in your toolbox things for like emergencies, things to prevent flares, things to like keep going day to day so that you can run like the life you want to. You can just go out and be yourself. Um, but when we actually fix this other issue, it turns out that a lot of your IBS symptoms were actually from this, right? And so in those cases, what we're doing here are kind of band-aids. And then once we solve this core issue or this root issue, um, you might need even less tools to manage your IBS. It could 
blow open all of your FODMAP buckets for you and suddenly you can eat a ton of things. Um, and so when I talk about these secondary issues, um, I'm thinking about like SIFO, which is small intestinal fungal overgrowth. I'm thinking about SIBO, which you might have heard about, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There's the new kid on the block, which is my favorite emo. It's intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And then we have things like H. pylori, uh, bile acid malabsorption or bile acid diarrhea, which we call BAM or BAD. Um, I found a client who had just back pain, um, and it turns out that once we got her IBS under control, um, she had like an issue with her spine that was finally addressed. Like she had it for years. We hooked her up with a great chiropractor. She's feeling so much better. Um, my symptoms were actually caused by endometriosis, which was crazy. Um, I've had clients who were having actually reactions to their medications or supplements and we got them swapped out for something else. A one client who like could not do her fructose challenge because every time she was using mangoes, every single time she's like, yes, mangoes. And every time she would do it, she would fail. It turned out she was allergic to mangoes. Um, so like I was trying and trying to get her to do a different food. Anyways, there are a ton of reasons that you could be having symptoms where your IBS is under control and what you're seeing is actually something else. And so while you're feeling like you're, you're having trouble getting control of your IBS, um, I want you to be open to the possibility that there might be something else there. And like a doctor or a health coach like me can help you put together a history of like, so here's what you asked me to do, right? Here's what I did here's what shifted, here's what didn't shift, your turn, right? Or like, here's what's left, your turn. And then sometimes this is how we discover these other things. Okay, so just to recap what we talked today, uh, what we talked about today, because I know we talked about um, a lot of things, um, is we have the five reasons that you're struggling to manage your IBS symptoms. And those are one, focusing only on food. Two, you are focusing on cutting foods out instead of adding foods in. Three, you're not addressing mechanical issues. And so those were like the um, uncoordinated muscles, the muscles contracting when they're supposed to be react, uh, relaxing. We had the reduced gut muscle tone. We had um, improper digestive hygiene. So that's like how you eat your food. The number four was we had your following contradictory advice. And then number five was you either don't have IBS or your IBS symptoms are under control and the things that are left are actually something else. Okay. So, um, does anybody have any questions before we close for today? So I'm going to leave a little space in case somebody needs clarification, unless some, uh, in case somebody has something that they want to ask. And of course, if you don't want to ask it here, you are more than welcome to ask in the Facebook group and I will do a little video for you. Um, you can also email me and there might be a post about it or a YouTube video. Um, but I do want to let everybody know before we go, I'm just going to drop a link in the chat. Um, I do have two spots open in my one-on-one -on -one coaching program right now. And so if you think having me as like your sidekick or your partner in crime, or you just need help or an accountability partner to really sort out the low FODMAP diet or to kind of figure out, um, how all of this works. Like if you are feeling like you're, you know, doing a hundred tasks and nothing is working for you. If you do feel like, you know, you've tried everything, your body's not broken. Okay, you are not unfixable. I have had so many people come through my program saying, this is my last little bit of hope. Like if this doesn't work, I'm dead. Um, and I haven't had a single person who's come out saying that this wasn't worth every penny. This wasn't like a fantastic experience. They just go out and live their lives. Um, so if you need help, if you are like tired of feeling like IBS is running your body instead of the other way around, if you were looking for so, like just feeling comfortable in your own skin, you want that peace of mind that you are not, you know, living your life like where is the bathroom or i'm afraid to leave or i don't know sort of what is going to be the next thing that wrecks my body i would absolutely love to invite you to a free my body my rules empowerment call during this call all we're going to do is figure out what ideal health look, looks like for you because it looks different for everybody we're going to figure out the number one thing that's keeping you from getting there so what is that obstacle for you right now and then we're going to decide what is the most powerful action step that you can take to sort of collapse that universe and get from where you are now to where you want to be and we're going to leave this call feeling excited and energized because not only are we going to make it really crystal clear for you um, what you want um, you're going to come out with an exact game plan for how to get there okay so 
If that sounds like something that would be helpful to you, I would love to talk to you. I've got calls open today. I have a couple of calls open during the week, but again, there's only two spots and they're first come first serve. So I left the link there. If you're interested, definitely submit an application form. Once you hit submit, there's a link right there that you can book in right with me. And I look forward to meeting you. Okay. So thank you again, everybody for coming today. I really appreciate you giving me some time on your Saturday morning and I will see you later.